everyone, Jackie with Full Moon Loan Designs and let's have the first kiln reveal, the first few projects that went in uh, where I cut some different components using the Sizzix. So this has actually been done for a few days and I just now got back down here so the kiln is definitely completely cool. And here's what we got. So from the last video this was the mica painted piece and I just fired this fired uh, I just went I believe it was 350 an hour I'll, I'll post schedules at the end of this video but I went 350 an hour to 1250 held for 15 minutes and then brought it down and annealed for an hour um, probably didn't need a full hour because these are all just single layer or less but there's the mica painted piece this was the powder wafer using the, uh, no, I'm sorry. This was the traditional powder wafer, just sifting powder over the paper. These were two of the powder wafers using the no days. And I'll pick them up and show you how delicate everything is. This was just mica powders uh, put on over the Versamark. And this was the freeze and fuse. So I think I'll just take a quick look here. The freeze and fuse, definitely a little thicker, a little rough, you know, probably not an ideal piece that I'll use in anything. This one looks pretty good. This is a nice, thin, delicate powder wafer, as are these. So these I'll definitely use on something, and I think I'll set that up today when I get the next projects ready. But anyway, here are the first fired pieces, and now I'll be working on the next steps and some additional pieces. Just a minor correction, I forgot. See, it's been a few days. Uh, all three of these pieces were actually done with the traditional powder wafer method of sifting powder over uh, just my kiln paper that was on the shelf. I completely forgot that over here is my powder wafer, uh, no days powder wafer, powder wafer leaf along with another piece. So I am gonna be using those, uh, I'll probably use the three of those plus this one, uh, just to really as a comparison on a piece. Uh, th these two I'm just gonna cap with clear. I have washed them, but I'm also gonna <clears throat> clean them a little better with some alcohol. So as you can see, they definitely retained plenty of the mica. And I'll be capping those in that same kiln load. We're gonna go ahead and fire this one as well as my Mirini piece and these little capped uh, dichroic pieces as well as this one that I'll probably put maybe a little more frit on and put a piece of clear under it. So more to come. I'll get a picture or some video when I get the kiln set up and show you a few of the processes as well. Okay, so I am ready to set these pieces up that are going to have some powder added to them. I, I always like to sift, or almost always, there are some exceptions uh, depending on the project and the technique. But for all of these pieces, I'm going to be sifting a layer of clear powder, not a thick layer, just really a dusting that covers it. I do this between layers to eliminate uh, and mostly reduce any little mumps, bumps, and bubbles. So that's what you're going to see me doing here. I am going to be putting on my mask, so I probably won't talk through this, but I wanted to show you some of the pieces that are going here. I have a just a teal base that is actually going to be for this one that had the leaf stenciled onto it. I did add a little frit around it because that leaf just looked a little lonely. <laughs> I have a clear base that I'm going to use for another uh, piece that I'm going to add those powder wafers to just as like a little soap dish sized piece. I have this piece of vanilla if you remember from the last video that is where these leaves are going to be added and I can go ahead and do that right now. I've still got my paper marked so I can remember kind of which are which. So these top two are thin fire, these bottom two are papyrus, it's been a few days, all of my glass line enamels have dried. So I just wanna sift a nice even layer of clear over this because when I put my top glass down, I, I wanna make sure that I've got a nice even surface. And then I have my two mica pieces back here that I'm just gonna cap with clear. But I'm gonna go over all of these now with uh, powder and then I'll be putting them together in the kiln and I'll show you what that looks like.
before I moved the camera over to the kiln, I remembered I still had these little dichroic pieces and their caps that I'm going to be putting on. So I am also going to sift a little clear powder over these. I don't know if you can see this one. There's actually a few little scratches in that in the dichro, and I kind of like it because it looks a little bit like veining in the leaves. So I'm hoping that stays, but we'll see. Should have enough powder left in here. So I forgot to go back and double check my list of to-dos for today. And yes, I had to make a list because I think I have post-holiday brain. And obviously because I forgot about this one. So I had these two pieces that were cut out, uh, the copper foil. So I am going to, similar to the piece with the, th the thin fire and papyrus cut out, so I'm gonna dust this with clear powder and cap it with clear. Okay, I messed up and didn't get video as I actually assembled these in the kiln but I thought I would show you what they look like going into fire. And I'm not sure why, I did sprinkle a little clear powder over my Mirini piece. I'm hoping that those all kind of melt down and fuse in together like my past pieces did that, that were done the same way. Pardon the noise, furnace is about to kick on, I think. Uh, this was the piece with the papyrus and the thin fire leaves. And that is capped now with clear. That was the mica painted piece capped with clear. These little powder wafer pieces are just sitting on the top surface. Now I am taking this to a full fuse and it's possible those are gonna fade a little bit, um, but we'll see how they look. These are the etched dichroic pieces and I do need to go through and just uh, square everything up or in the, in the oval case. Uh, cases to uh, oval them up, I guess. I just need to move my glass, make sure everything's uh, ready to go before I turn the kiln on. There is the mica powder that was over the uh, verse mark, and that's been capped with clear powder and clear glass. This is just the stenciled powder piece. This has nothing to do with the project. It's just another piece I'm working on. It's another cheese board uh, for a special gift. <laughs> And these I forgot to show during the process. I think I did just grab a video clip when I was going to add the powder, but these are the two copper foil inclusions. So I'm going to close this up, take it to a full fuse, and we'll see what they look like when they come out. I thought I would share my setup. I have to think a little bit ahead of time for these kiln carved pieces because I won't really be able to see where my placement of my fiber pieces are once these are fused. Uh, like for instance, this bigger piece, I'm gonna be using a piece of petrified wood backed with some turquoise, which I don't think I've used that combination. I usually use robin's egg, but I had a small piece of turquoise so I didn't have to cut into my bigger piece of robin's egg. And when that comes out, because I'm gonna pre-fuse it, I'm not gonna be able to see where this stuff is. So what I did was I took one of my pieces of glass here and I cut these because I wanted them to fit this mold. I just love this little mold. Uh, I cut them to fit that and then I laid it down on the shelf, traced around it, and then I was able to drop my leaves, leaves that I'm going to be placing this down over later, uh, kind of place them where I wanted. And what I did was I just took a pen. I didn't completely trace them. I basically just made some registration marks. So if these get bumped and moved, I'm just gonna take this whole piece of paper off of here and set it aside uh, because I am gonna use this shelf with a different piece of paper on it to do the pre-fuse. I am pre-fusing because I have done this in the past where not so much with this type where you're, you've got it sitting on top of the negative to sink in, but definitely where I've had a piece under it where it wouldn't maybe be sitting flat. And what happened was I had two layers. I had a really cute reindeer piece a few years back. And because I didn't pre-fuse them, <clears throat> excuse me, I should have taken a drink before I started talking. Because I didn't pre-fuse them during the process, even though I, I didn't go that fast, they sort of slid apart. So I ended up having my two layers shifted and it ruined the piece. So I'm gonna pre-fuse the pieces but they're gonna have most, I believe all of these will have opal backs and I won't be able to see them. So that's why I'm doing a little bit of thinking ahead and setting up the shelf. And this one here, this is the one that I'm gonna do that's more of the negative space. And this one, I'm actually taking two layers and I've, I, I need to line them up a little bit better when I get to this stuff. 
these two will be fused together. This one actually is robin's egg blue. It's pretty close to the size there. I'm probably going to end up tracing around it, although I probably don't need to. I can really see that it's just pretty much coming to the tips. I'm not sure how this is going to turn out because it is so close to my cutout. I have a feeling it might shift down in there and it might mess it up. Then again, it could turn out really cool. So I'm the reason it is such an odd shape is I had these two pieces. They were the cutouts that these were cut from, but I didn't have them necessarily in the same area of the fiber. So they were kind of sitting like this and I didn't want like a square hanging off of any edges because of course it's gonna pick that up during the firing. So I am gonna very carefully line these up, set these on top of it um, after they've been pre-fused. Uh, but that is what I'm working on today uh, in preparation for doing the kiln carving step. So a little bit of prep, just thinking ahead of time so that I know where to see them. I'm going to set this piece aside. I am going to grab a sheet that I have cut. And I do have a piece of one, mil, uh, one millimeter fiber. I think I've shared before I have a big roll of this. Uh, and I put it down because my shelf here is a little bit rough in spots. And it also kind of gives a neat finish, I think, when you use it, uh, especially with thin fire that's a little bit thinner. It's interesting because it's almost like you get a texture, but it's very smooth because of the thin fire. All I did there was roll that the opposite way for a little bit. So yeah, I'm going to set this up. I'm going to clean all my pieces, go in for a pre-fuse. I will, uh, I will not be dusting powder. So this is one of the exceptions. Uh, earlier in the video, I mentioned that I almost always sift powder between layers. When I'm working with petrified wood and I want reactions, I'm not gonna sift any clear powder between layers. So these won't have any powder. I will do a nice bubble squeeze. Um, actually, I think I'm just using the bullseye schedule. I've had pretty good luck with that. Uh, for the petrified wood and I was even apprehensive the first time I used it because it's got some pretty fast ramp rates but it's worked so you know what they say if it ain't broke don't fix it <laughs> so so far I'm using that and it's working well but I do believe there is a bubble squeeze segment in there I'll have to look at it again so I'm going to pre-fuse these guys and then I'm going to bring that other piece of paper back over for this shelf and do the kiln carving step as I was going through my uh, pieces I wanted to go with the petrified wood and not wanting to cut into my bigger piece of robin's egg blue. I did have some little pieces, some more turquoise and robin's egg. So you know what? I decided for my four inch square I was just going to cut two two by four inch pieces and I'm going to take a sanding pad or a diamond pad to them just a little bit more. I did a little bit just to make sure I can really square them up. And I'm just going to place the top layer over it and this way we'll get to see both of those colors and how they react uh, with the petrified wood. Anyway, I just thought I would share. Sometimes uh, just having the smaller pieces to work with might just lead to something interesting. So here are the three petrified wood pieces. A little hard to see the colors down in here. The light's not great over here. Uh, they did get pretty dark and that always is kind of a mystery with this glass. It could get a little darker. Um, it might be a little lighter. A lot of it depends on how much clear spaces there are in the glass. Uh, but I'm gonna take these out, clean them up, and we'll get a closer look. All right, let's take a look at these out of the kiln. Uh, most were successful. A couple I should have known better on what I did, and I'll explain that. Uh, these were the ones that I'm going to set up for kiln carving. This is bullseye petrified wood. This piece was over turquoise. So you can see the beautiful reactions there. Sorry for the reflections. This one was over the mix of both robin's egg and turquoise. And honestly, from the top surface, I really can't see a difference. This one did turn pretty dark, but it had a lot of dark area on the glass. It's kind of a mystery with petrified wood on just what you'll end up with. And then this round, also very pretty. This one had robin's egg underneath. This one I really like. And if you look at it closely, there's some depth there, uh, just with the clear cap over it. A few little bubbles, they're not bothering me. But this was copper foil. And notice how it turned a beautiful blue. I hope you can see that color 
in the video. Get it into the light there. Gorgeous blue. So copper foil on a white base glass capped in clear. This was a stencil, not a super neat one, but it was on reactive glass. And the frit I used also reacts with vanilla. So kind of fun, a little interesting. This one, I obviously, because it was using thin, and I think I had two layers of thin possibly, uh, should have went lower temp or added another layer. But I'm gonna clean up the edges. I'll take it to the grinder um, or the lap grinder, square it all up and uh, fire polish that one. These two are done. All I gotta do is add bales. So these, these, all three of these were done etching using the stencil cut on the Sizzix. So that was dichroic that was etched. This one, a few little spiky edges. I wasn't even thinking when I sifted the powder over it. So I can clean that up with a narrow uh, bit on the grinder. But honestly, this was a top surface. When I do these, I really like the bottom surface because look how crisp the design is there. So I will use this on something else once I get it cleaned up. This I'm very happy with. I do have a, I can feel a little bit of a bubble there, but you really can't see much. And if I rotate it this way, these top two, uh, let me double check that. No, these top two <laughs> were the thin fire, the bottom two were the papyrus. And I just remember that because the two papyrus ones had a bit more uh, white showing through, but they fused in beautifully. That was glass line paint on the little cutouts. This piece, I totally screwed up using the No Days Powder Wafer on here because I forgot you have a different schedule for that. And I will share the No Days schedule uh, because I did use it on the snowflake back there and we'll look at that closer in a second. So this one, yeah, not very nice. It's got a bit of an odd texture to it, but I didn't really lose anything with the powder wafers. I did develop a little bubble here it's almost like a little fleck of something got into my glass. I'm not sure if something fell off of the lid or not. Um, this piece, I'm probably just gonna set aside. I don't think I'm gonna bother slumping it just cause it does have a really awful finish there. I could always uh, cover it with something, use it as a base for something else. I'm not gonna throw it out just yet because it is usable in some form. My mica pieces, uh, I wish I would have went back to my notes. So. While this still looks pretty, it really lost a lot of color, and I know why. It's because I went to such a high temp. I went to 1485 on this full fuse load, and I believe I usually only go around 1400. I do have another video on mica paint, uh, and I'm going to go back to my own notes and double check that. So lesson learned, uh, went a little too hot, fused nicely, and I didn't totally lose the mica. I just lost some of the color. But this one that was just the powder over the Versamark, definitely lost that. So another one that I'm just gonna set aside, maybe use that as a base piece for something else. And then this was the Broken Snowflake that I ended up adding more powder yesterday. I probably didn't need to because again, if you've used Valcox's colors, you know that they're very concentrated. So while this is a, I believe this is the new violet powder, uh, it's very deep purple. <laughs> like the band. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's a very deep purple color, um, but I like it. It turned out I got a little bit of a halo effect around it, but I did fire this one per the no days schedule, and I did add uh, some dichroic flakes. Hopefully you can see those throughout, not just on the snowflake, and then I dusted that really well with clear powder so it's smooth. So those are all of the pieces out of the kiln. I am going to move the camera over and set up the kiln carving for these three. Uh, this piece was just in the kiln because I had the space and needed to do it. Uh, just a cheese board panel and I used some a cut out a pre-cut piece uh, for the dragonfly. And this is one of Tabitha's uh, from Tabitha's Glass Emporium, one of her ladybugs. Just super cute. Just on the top, a little bit of clear powder over both uh, and clear powder over the uh, green just because I wanted to make sure that I had a food safe surface. I think green is okay, but if in doubt, I cover with clear. So anyway, th those are the fired pieces. A few of these are ready to slump. This one will not, that's going onto a board. This will slump. I'll probably go ahead and slump that piece. This one, 
and these two. This I gotta figure out what I'm gonna add it to, but I will do that and I may even do it in the same load with this. Yes, I know this is 90, but I think I can adjust my annealing schedule and anneal for both. Um, but I might just hang on to this and do that later in the week. Uh, but anyway, next step, I'm gonna be showing you the setup for the kiln carving, and then I'm gonna pop some of these back into the kilns. One thing I wanted to do before putting these pieces of fiber under my glass was just give them a little coat with a zip but I'm gonna offer a little tip if you do this with small cutouts. Probably best to tape or pin them down to your cardboard. That's, well, whatever you're using for a spray surface. But yeah, I had a little bit of a challenge each time I would go to spray, they would start flying all over. So I would pin them down probably with just some little straight pins, uh, like sewing pins, uh, just to some cardboard and then give them a quick spray. And I'm just doing this to keep them from really kind of embedding or uh, sticking or causing any spikes in the glass. So cut it, coated them with zip and going to put them under the glass and I'll show you the setup. So I have set up my shelf now. This is the one that I did uh, in preparation before fusing so that I would know where to place my glass. Uh, but I did change it up a little bit. I decided instead of that floral piece that I originally had for the square, I thought the petrified wood colors really lent themselves more to the leaves, so I just kind of kept the leaf thing going. Uh, I will use this, just not on this glass. So I have cleaned my glass and I did put on some gloves just so I'm not getting fingerprints all over them. Uh, because as mentioned, I'm going to put this, I think I mentioned it, I'm going to put my top surface down. I do have my pieces with the uh, kind of the raised edges up where the Sizzix cut though, or you know, kind of emboss those. And all I'm gonna do now is just carefully set this glass down within my outline there. And I think that looks good. Not even gonna mess with it. This piece, again, came out pretty dark, but I am going to use leaves with it. Doesn't really matter which orientation I go kind of like the striping going this way so we'll do that which is interesting because the back it's going the opposite way and those were the one millimeter paper or I'm sorry one millimeter fiber uh, cut and stacked and I believe there's three layers so really three millimeters and this is the one eighth inch fiber and this is the negative space and I hope I've got this lined up pretty well I'm seeing a bit of a lump here that I don't like, and it's going to show up in my leaf. I might even just end up flipping this guy over. Let's see. Yeah, I like the crispness of this side better. Granted, this side isn't covered in zip. I'm not too worried. This is a total experiment, but I'm going to take this round, and I am just going to lay it over that. I can see that it's just coming right to the edge. So this may or may not work out, but what it should do is as the uh, temp goes up and it gets into more of a slump temperature, and I'll, I'll post my schedules I use, uh, it should kind of sink down into that where uh, the opposite is happening with these. The, the glass is gonna kind of sink around the cutouts. So that is kiln carving slash, I've also heard it called bas relief. I don't know if there's a difference in the two, to be honest, I'd have to do a little research. Uh, but I am gonna pop these into the kiln. I'm gonna take them up to a nice slump hold and hopefully they will pick up those uh, fiber pieces. And I'm sure they will because again, if you've ever had maybe a seam in your fiber paper underneath a glass or a bump on your shelf or something you didn't think would get picked up, it gets picked up in your glass pretty easily. So I think these should turn out all right. And I am going to pause the camera, get this over into the kiln, and I'm gonna set the slump pieces up for their slump as well. All right, I have the kiln set up to slump and I've got a few different things going on as far as types of molds. Uh, three of them are just basic square slumpers. I believe Bullseye makes those. I've had them for years, some of my first molds. But this one was just a little too small. Uh, I was afraid my glass, and that was for this copper piece, uh, copper foil inclusion piece. I was afraid it was gonna hang over the edge maybe, because it's not a super deep drop. 
and I didn't want that to go over the edge and possibly crack the glass. So I've got uh, fiber paper and some stainless wire around it. I'm probably getting fingerprints on this piece now, but I'm just going to basically center my glass right over that because I just wanted a basic slump. And that should be fine just like that. Uh, and I'll double check it uh, off camera to make sure I've got that even. This one, I probably should cold work it because it does uh, stick out a little bit from the powder wafer. I'm not too worried. I know the recipient's going to like it. <laughs> and so this one, I'm just slumping on this basic square slumper that is just the perfect size for it. This one, the mica piece that faded, I'm still going to go ahead and slump it. I am going to just use this six inch slumper that is just a little too big, but it also will work just fine for just a basic slump. Sorry for the reflections there. This back one here is one of the little molds. I, I want to say it's like mold number 99 or something like that. It, it's, it's on Lori Spray's uh, site, the uh, Bonnie Dune Fused Glass Tools. And they're just little three inch molds and they're great for these little trinket sized dishes. Get my glass centered there. And then the center one, of course, is a bottomless mold. I love these. I use them a lot for rounds because they do uh, work pretty well. I just have a piece of, I think it's papyrus under there. It was just a small scrap. And that's where I'm gonna put this piece and I'm just gonna center it on the mold. And now these are set up and ready to slump. So I'll share the schedule at the end and I'll show you what they look like when they come out of the kiln. All right, so this kiln load is done and these pieces are ready to come out. See, they all look slumped. So I'll get a better shot of them over on the table. Okay, so we can take a closer look at these. And one is a total bummer. And to me, I think it's incompatibility cracks. I did have a problem where my power went out last night, uh, but I don't think it had even gotten to the uh, top temp yet. So I just restarted the program and Everything else in the load seems fine. So this was the mica piece. This was just slumped. This is the one that I had slumped that I added the uh, sides to the mold so that it wouldn't go over the edge. And as you can see, it slumped really nicely. This one was in the little three inch. And yes, it is mold number 99 on the Bonnie Dune site uh, for little three inch squares. And then this was a bottomless mold, and I just love those because this does sit nice and it slumped very evenly. So those are the pieces out so far. Uh, the other kiln with the kiln carved pieces is cooling down, and I'll get a look at those tomorrow. Okay, so these are the kiln carved pieces. I have not seen them yet. I have not touched them. The only thing I did was got the shelf lifted out of the kiln and brought it over here to the table. So let's see together. Okay, looks kind of cool. That one I'm probably done with now and I may use it as like a pin or some type of a, oh, I'm just thinking like for a scarf, a scarf pin would be cool. And I could use that uh, fiber again, I think I did probably have to kind of pat it down and even it out because I need a couple dents. So this was the one millimeter uh, three pieces stacked. And I'll get a better picture once I rinse these off. But yeah, you can definitely see the leaves there. And I'm going to slump that one. And this is the bigger one. Sorry if the camera's moving a lot. loving that and I'm hoping that they all retain this in the slump firing so I'm going to clean them up and put them right back in the kiln for the slump at least this one and the square and we'll see what they look like when they come out. Here's a quick look once they were cleaned up. This is the round. I'm done firing with that one. 
Here's the larger piece. Uh, I believe this is four by eight and a quarter. And then this is about a three and a half inch square. So I'm gonna pop them in and slump them, and I'm hoping that I retain the uh, carved effect in them, but we'll find out. Okay, so the last of the projects are about to be revealed here. This kiln has been cooling down for a while. It's at 77. And I still see the leaves and the slump. So I'm going to take them out and clean them up and put them over on the table and we'll look at them a little closer. Okay, the last of the projects are out of the kiln uh, from beginning to end through this process. And I'll just touch a little bit on each one and the, how the Thinlet's Sizzix dies were used. This one and th these three that you can see leaves were just sifted with powders through a cardstock stencil. One was cardstock, one was the, uh, what do you call it, craft board from Cricut. So that was just stenciling powders uh, onto the, well, these were just onto the shelf as powder wafers. And this one was directly onto the glass, but all kind of the same method, sifting powders through a stencil. And then we did, I did this piece, but I need to do some testing. Uh, somehow I've got something going on here with compatibility because none of the other pieces in the kiln are having any issues. I had a three millimeter white and a two millimeter white. I had my powder wafer on top and I'm gonna test some more white with that color of powder. Everything was 96, but we know that uh, COE doesn't necessarily mean it's always compatible. And I did sift clear over it, but it's the same clear powder that I've been using on everything else. So I don't really suspect the clear at all. So sad because I did end up really liking this, uh, even with the broken powder wafer, but that was using the No Days powder wafer, as was this one green one, but I screwed up and I fired it. Uh, this one I did not fire correctly. This one I fired uh, just with my regular fuse. This one was fired to the no day schedule. So a little bummed, but yeah, it definitely seems like I've got something incompatible. Uh, those were just smaller pieces. I think I still do have a little bit of that white that I use, so I might even test with some more of that. Maybe some with powder wafer and some without. So something to work on tomorrow. Let's see what else. Cut copper foil inclusions. So these were just the copper foil pieces. And I just put them on a white base and capped with clear. I did sift clear powder in between on this. They turned a really pretty blue color. A few little bubbles, but in general looks really good. I think that's just a perfect little soap dish. I used glass lime paint on Thin Fire and Papyrus, and really there's no difference. The only difference is just in my application of uh, paint. I didn't get it quite as densely covered. And this one seems a little paler, and again, I think it was just my paint coverage. These two were the Thin Fire though, so it could be that because that's a little bit thinner material, it pulled in you know into the glass and that could be why we lost a little bit of color there i think that if i were going to do it again i would just use papyrus because the shape stayed crisp the colors look nice uh, but same process just uh, cut them from the shelf paper and put them down on the glass i made sure i had a good bubble squeeze i do believe i held that one longer and i will have the schedules all at the end of the video uh, but yeah, and then clear on top and clear powder in between as well. So those were the paper inclusions. This was the mica paint that I screwed up and did a hotter full fuse schedule. I should have only gone, actually I did go back to my notes uh, since I have recorded last. And my mica paint video that's also out there on YouTube, and I'll have it linked in the description below, uh, I only went to 1385 and I still got a nice fuse. So know your kilns, you know, if the lowest temp that you can get a nice full fuse at is where you would want to go with uh, doing the mica paints. But I didn't lose all of the mica and actually I think that looks quite lovely.
it's just not the red it's more of a kind of a copper color now so another little small dish these two were the kiln card pieces this one and the square actually and a round one here so this was bullseye petrified wood I do have some texture going on on the top and I'm okay with that it's kind of a weird mix of texture and shine and it all has to do with how the glass was laying on the uh, cutouts and as well as I believe I had papyrus down around them so maybe if I would have used thin fire uh, that might have been a little bit smoother but again I'm okay with it it's got really kind of some interesting texture and the colors are just fantastic so that again was fiber paper that this had fused over and I like that even though I slumped it it kept its kept the imprints there from the cone carving as did this one now this was I think it was from the same sheet of glass just different sections this one was a bit darker because it didn't have as much of the clearer uh, where the, it's just like a red reactive type of uh, where it looks clear um, this one it just looks darker but again I'm okay with it I like the colors it also kept you can see the texture these were the one millimeter fiber and that stuff does have a bit of texture so you can definitely see the texture on those and the little bit of texture that it picked up so a little mix and you know shiny versus matte or texture but I'm not hating it this was the round one it didn't get slumped well aside from just the kiln carving step here we go and I think I'm going to do some type of uh, finding on that to turn this into like a scarf pen. Let's see, the other things I did were the flower that was in the negative space. And I had done a couple pieces like this last year. I still need to clean this one up and I will fuse it onto something, um, probably just a, a little bit bigger square and make a little plate with it and do a full fuse. This was the underside, so this side is really glossy, but this side is very crisp, and this is the side that I would have up in the next firing. This needed another layer and or less heat because I was using thin, and <laughs> you can see how it dog boned because, you know, six millimeter rule. But it's gonna be easy enough to square that up on the grinder or the lap grinder and just throw it back in for a fire polish. This was, using the stencil material uh, the same stencil material that did the mica paint stencil um, and i used the blue it's a cricut uh, stencil vinyl uh, this one i just put the uh, cutout part of the stencil onto the glass so where the let's see if i can explain this right and you probably remember from the last video or two videos ago maybe now so let's say this was my stencil vinyl I had a cutout right there, and that's what this is. So, so this was painted into the negative space. This was the positive cutout put over the glass and then etched around it. The whole piece was this kind of purple dichro, but everything etched to black, and you'll see how it, it did shine up. But I am going to have to trim this one out and fire polish it. And then I had the two other pieces that were also etched. These are done, just need bales. So those are all of the pieces. The only thing that really didn't work was uh, the modeling glass. And I'm sure if I messed around, got it between the right kind of paper, I might be able to do something, but probably less pressure too, because it was kind of just pushing it out through the plates. And then the foil, I did have a few people comment and I, I think I would try this again. And with the silver foil, uh, using paper on each side of it so that the foil, it doesn't get all distorted and tear. So I didn't have good luck with just cutting it directly, but I think if I tried it between paper as others have suggested, and I appreciate those suggestions, so thank you. But anyway, I'm gonna wrap this video up, get it all edited together and post it. And I really thank you all for watching and sticking through it if you've been uh, with us since the first Sizzix video. And the other thing I wanna add is this was really just to show different techniques uh, using cutouts and you don't have to use a Sizzix. You, if you have a cutting machine like a Cricut or a Silhouette, you could cut shapes with those. And I do have other videos out there that, that I've done some of that. 
you could hand cut. You can use an X-Acto knife or one of the True Control knives. Uh, you can just cut with scissors. You can use paper punches. There's so many different ways that you could do these different cutouts and it doesn't have to be any kind of technology involved. You know, maybe just basic punches. You can get a lot of things too. So I hope this has given you some ideas on how to use things like that and have those inclusions in your class. So as always, thanks for watching. I'll gather these all up here for one last shot. That one's just sad. And I will pick up the camera and move it. This one, uh, as I did talk earlier, it's got a bad one here. Uh, and that's only because I didn't follow the right schedule. That was the No Days Powder Wafer and not just the powder onto the shelf. So that is... And then I did have the one that faded, the other Mica Paint one that faded really bad, and I dropped that one and actually broke it. So won't be able to see that one in with all of these, but with the camera. And I'll try to get a good still shot here too. So I hope this has inspired you and given you some ideas. And uh, most of all, have a safe and happy New Year's. Uh, it'll be 2023 in just a few hours where I am. Thanks again for watching.